Good afternoon and welcome. My name is John Page and I am the Marketing and Membership Manager for the Amherst Area Chamber of Commerce and I want to officially welcome you to our Economic Development Panel. The mission of the Amherst Area Chamber of Commerce is to create, maintain, and promote a vital, thriving business community throughout the Amherst area and to initiate and support the civic, educational, recreational, and economic vitality of the Amherst area. Today, we're going to drill down and explore what that means and what action steps we can take to realize this mission. As you may have seen in today's edition of Business West, thank you, Business West, Claude and I have spent the past year rebuilding a strong foundation, but this panel represents a shift to more strategic focus as we move forward. A focus on cultivating a community and business environment in which people of all ages, backgrounds, income brackets, where family, young professionals, and retirees can live, work, learn, and thrive. Today, we will start with a presentation on our state of economic development in Amherst, and then a panel discussion about our community's strategic advantage, challenges, and a vision for the future for economic development in the Amherst area. Peter will introduce our wonderful panelists shortly. At the conclusion of the panel, we will encourage you to continue the conversation downstairs over appetizers and drinks provided by UMass Dining. The conversation is most valuable if all of us lean in and engage. There are easels and a pad of paper and markers downstairs, as well as index cards. If you didn't get an index card, I can provide you with one, where you can document your questions, comments, and ideas, which will serve as a guide as we plan future chamber programming. I'd like to take this moment to recognize a few people are here. First, we have some elected officials present. So will our town councilors who are present please stand. We are also joined by our town manager, Paul Bachelman. I'd also like to re recognize any chamber board members that are in the room. Please stand. And then a little bit of news, I would like to mention that Lynn Gray of the Hampshire Mall, who was elected to our board of directors at our annual meeting in January, has risen to the role of vice president for our board. We could not have a better partner, especially as we seek to strengthen our ties with Hadley. A few more thank yous are in order. We are proud to partner with Bobrowski and Vickery LLC and the University of Massachusetts Amherst to make this event possible. We're excited for this beautiful space. And I want to thank Chris Oakley of the Old Chapel for all he's done to make this day a success. And a shout out to Amherst Media, who's doing our filming this evening. So there will be a recording, which we can share with others. And also our photographer, Brandon, who is here with us tonight. At this time, I would like to thank, I would like to invite Tony Maroulis up to the stage, Executive Director of External Relations and University Events for UMass, to give some remarks. Hi everyone, uh, good afternoon and well Mike. welcome to Old Chapel. Um, this is, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. How many of, are you, of you are here for the first time? All right, so welcome and do stay for the reception afterwards. Downstairs we have an interactive video wall that we would encourage you to, uh, to play around with. Uh, on the video wall, there are about 500 preloaded stories that tell the story of UMass, along with a number of social media uh, uh, feeds that uh, come into the wall uh, from various Twitter accounts on campus, including our Falcons at the Du Bois Library. So they have a lot to say, and it's really exciting. So you should take a peek at that. So um, a couple of things I, I do want to say, uh, you know, we're lucky to have John Page uh, taking a full-time role with the Chamber right now. I didn't hear a lot of applause from him before. But I'm sure, like many of you, it was uh, really exciting to see that uh, we are going to have John around here for a little while longer. It's really great to have you with us. Um, a couple of things, I, I um, you know, it's, it's written down as remarks, it sounds really formal, and I'm not really a formally guy, and so um, I was challenging myself today by not writing any remarks and seeing if I could do everything off the cuff. Uh, those who know me from my old chamber days knows that, know that that could be a little bit dangerous, so I'll try to keep this uh, super brief. 
But um, I am really excited about this panel. I'm excited uh, about the chamber hosting it and the, and the direction in which this organization is going again uh, to uh, talk about the economic uh, development conditions here in town uh, and in the region uh, is quite an exciting thing. Um, as many of you know, I'm a big advocate for this town. Um, it's a place, although I live in Pelham, I feel like I'm an honorary Amherst person. Um, I keep asking Paul to annex my town. Uh, this is on Amherst Media. I'm going to get in trouble, I'm sure, for saying that. Um, Amherst owns all of Pelham anyway, so please take us over. Um, okay, I'm glad I'm getting something here. And as you all know, I want that. Uh, but, uh, you know, Amherst is a particularly exciting place with, a, with a, an immense amount of potential. Um, and one of the things that I always like to say is that uh, we have all of the ingredients, we just haven't made the right soup quite yet. Um, today's all-star panel, I think, will be able to uh, talk a little bit about those ingredients and, and the ways in which uh, we might make a better soup and one that's more tasty and that'll bring in a lot more business and people into the region. Um, from our perspective, John has asked me to talk a little bit about the university and the college's impact um, on economic development, and I, I'll get to speak for um, our friends over at Amherst and Hampshire right now, but, um, but our colleges, of course, it share a symbiotic relationship with the town. Um, you know, from UMass alone, um, and I'm going to bring up some old stats now, none of which are updated, but we bring in about $1.2 billion of economic impact yearly to the local economy. Uh, we impact things, you know, such as our local farms, where we buy 30% of our produce for our, uh, our dining services operation. Uh, we spend uh, quite a bit of money in the local community on catering to our local restaurants, to business that we uh, do at some local businesses like Amherst Copy, uh, at Hastings, etc. Um, we'd like to see more of that happen, and there's been recent investments in uh, the university by the Commonwealth, uh, thanks to uh, Stan Rosenberg, in, in some cases, for, for his advocacy over the years. Hi, Stan, how are you? Good to see you. And, um, you know, looking at our, uh, at Isles and the, the core facilities that we have, uh, and uh, the voucher program to encourage business and, and business growth, uh, as well as, you know, Mass Bio. We just unveiled the Mass Bio ribbon cutting. Uh, not too long ago on April 29th, which is an exciting, uh, uh, exciting uh, turn of events for us here on campus. So we have a business, we're open for business sign um, here at the university. We'd like to think about ways and encourage ways that we can do more partnerships here in Amherst and in the region. Um, and so again, we welcome you here today. Um, I'm looking forward to this panel and at this time, I'm gonna call up the president of the chamber, Peter Vickery. Thank you, Tony, and thank you to the university for co-sponsoring, and thank you for attending. Thank you, panelists, and to Amos Media for filming. My job is very simple this evening. It is to ask some questions and introduce our panelists. And before I do that, let me just remind you that if you would like to contribute some questions or comments, please do use those postcards that were distributed earlier on. Um, we'll have three questions, three guiding questions, before the panelists start conversing. And part of my job is to uh, to ensure that the conversation keeps going. What we're aiming for tonight is not so much one of those candidates debate style sequential answers, but rather an actual conversation which will then continue downstairs. So the first part of my job is to introduce Jeff Kravitz, who will then uh, do uh, a presentation which the panel discussion will follow. So let me tell you a little bit about Jeff Kravitz. This is my impersonation of Jeff Kravitz, by the way. Now he... <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> Jeff Kravitz, Economic Development Director at the Town of Amherst, was born and raised in Amherst. He received a Bachelor of Arts degree from Colgate University in 2002, where he majored in computer science. He also holds a JD from the University of Maryland School of Law. After graduating from law school, Jeff became the Government Affairs Director for the Staten Island Chamber of Commerce for two years. He then moved to Boston, where he served as the Deputy Chief of Staff for the Massachusetts Executive Office of Housing and Economic Development. 
In that role, he worked with municipal officials to launch the Newton Needham Innovation Corridor and drafted economic development legislation. As the Deputy Director of Cabinet Affairs for Governor Deval Patrick, Jeff focused on policy initiatives in education, labor, and workforce development, public safety, and economic development, where he resolved high priority issues including audit responses, federal waiver requests, implementation of legislation, and international collaborations. In 2016, Jeff returned to his hometown as Amherst's first economic development director. He oversees business recruitment, retention and expansion efforts, advises on the economic impact of policy decisions and conducts economic research for the town. Current initiatives include town gown relations, creating an economic development strategy, participating in the steering committee for the Amherst Centre Cultural District, leading parking management efforts and coordinating the local implementation of legal marijuana. So on behalf of the Amherst Area Chamber of Commerce, serving Amherst, Belchdown, Hadley, Leverett, Pelham, Shrewsbury and Sunderland, welcome Jeff Kravitz. Thank you everybody. Um, my first notes were to say thank you. So everybody's been thanked already. If you haven't, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you panel. Uh, won't waste time with that. Um, I've been asked to give a brief introduction to the Amherst economy and so I'm going to start off with my one attempt at a joke which is a Dilbert cartoon basically saying that the first three sections are going to be PowerPoint slides. They're going to be kind of boring but informative and then we'll get to some pretty pictures at the end. Um, so employment and unemployment data. The first is the unemployment rate which you'll see has dropped uh, by more than 50% in the last nine years. I think this is uh, up to 2018 so uh, eight years and it's still been dropping this year. Um, and then looking a little bit more into that, here's sort of the last two years or so um, month by month breakdown. And the reason I put this slide in here was to highlight, and I don't know if you can see it, but the summer months uh, are peak unemployment. That's not really a surprise, um, but it's sort of confirmation of, of how we know the economy works in Amherst. Um, you know, faculty who are coming back for the next year or uh, restaurants or other businesses that downsize for a smaller population over the summer. Um, so looking at employment, we have added 2,300 jobs in 2010. Um, and by the way, this is my five to 10 minute economic overview. If we can, break this data down um, so you know where we added jobs as well, but I didn't feel like I had time. So, uh, but very quickly, where do people work? So education is the largest sector by number of employees, no surprise there. Healthcare is actually the largest by the number of businesses. And then hotels, restaurants, and bars, which are grouped together for Amherst, this is really restaurants and bars. Um, they're the third largest sector by business count and the second largest by the number of people that they employ. Looking at wages, um, the average, oh, average weekly wage has gone up $150 per week uh, since 2010. And that turns out to about $8,000 a year or an 18% increase, which is fairly significant. Um, and if you break it down by industry, and this is a whole bunch of industries, but $12 an hour is the minimum wage, $13.39 is what I saw as the um, regional living wage, and across all industries, the average hourly wage in Amherst is $24.88, so it's over double the minimum wage. There are only three industries it's arts, entertainment, and recreation, accommodation and food services, and agriculture, forestry, and fishing, which happen to be uh, overall under the, the minimum wage or the living wage. So tourism, this is some interesting data. Um, locally, we have a 6% rooms tax, um, and we see that 
generally it's been going up with uh, one um, minor dip, but I, it's also a good time to mention that recently the council adopted a 6% um, tax on short-term rentals, which the legislature had passed, and that goes into effect July 1st. And there's also going to be a, an additional 3% community impact fee on those rentals. Um, so we will likely see the um, rooms expenditures go up when we track that data as well. But it's unclear there are how many short-term rentals apply because there are stipulations you have to rent for more than 14 days out of the year. You can't rent for more than 30 or 31 days consecutively. You have to own a certain number of units uh, within a municipality. So it's unclear exactly what that is going to be, but um, just an interesting fact. Here is how much people have spent on meals, and that has nearly tripled since 2010. So that's definitely a good sign. Um, not quite at the pace as we were coming out of the recession, but still uh, on the upswing each time. Visitor data. So we just, I just started collecting this. Um, arts and culture, I think, is a, is a hugely important part of the Amherst economy, and we don't do a very good job of explaining how big and how important it is. So one of the things that I wanted to start doing is collecting data about where people visit. And so nine of the institutions that I had reached out to that I think, hey, people would come to Amherst to visit for a certain reason. These are the ones that responded in time. And you'll see there's half a million visitors um, that come to Amherst. And I'm sure there are going to be questions, so I'll address them now. This is the number of people who walk through the door. So I have no idea if these people live in Amherst or live across the country or across the world. Um, that just people counting to various events. But it's a place to start and to refine the data moving forward. So this is the beginning of the pretty pictures. And we're going to just Again, to give everybody in the room some information on what's been going on. So in 2017, um, Spring Street was permitted. That's uh, currently a vacant lot. Um, and it's going to be 58 downtown residential units and 1,000 square feet. And I think construction is going to begin on that um, later this summer. Uh, South Point Apartments has 47 new residential units, also permitted in 2017. Um, six of them affordable, and it's an expansion of an existing um, development. In 2018, um, Aspen Heights was permitted, and I, I, last I heard, it, it is moving forward. Um, there has been an agreement, and so it's going to be 88 residential units, 11 of them affordable. Um, and redevelopment of a former 1960s motel. Um, and University Drive, 36 <laughs> residential units, four affordable um, commercial space, and a restaurant as well. And then updates, one East Pleasant is occupied. Uh, the restaurants are in permitting. I think one of them, Aya Sushi, should be opening um, by the end of the summer. And North Square is under construction, 130 residential units, 26 affordable, and 22,000 square feet of commercial leasing now. And if you want to lease, talk to Jennifer. <laughs> so um, that is my brief update. I think the reason everybody is here is not to hear me talk about these things, but to hear the entire panel um, have a discussion on the issues facing Amherst. So. Thank you all once again for the discussion. Great, thank you, Peter. I'll get back to the uh, other panelists. So please bear with me while I, I read through their short bios, starting with Jennifer Gannett, who is Director of Community Development for WD Coles, developing the next phases of the Mill District in North Amherst. Incorporating community enhancing elements into the mill district, she's pursuing a riverwalk multi-use trail and wayfinding kiosks so mill district residents and visitors 
will walk to recreational opportunities including regional trails and Mill River Recreation Area, Cherry Hill Golf Course and Puffers Pond. Jennifer is spearheading the next phases of Mill District development, finding partners to create places such as a music venue, alumni senior housing, condos for young professionals, a brew pub, a brew pub, okay, great, wedding venue and other mixed use buildings on a four acre parcel north of Coles Road, a 15 acre parcel west of Sunderland Road and other larger acre parcels. You can follow her progress on Facebook at the Mill District NA. Sarah LaCour is the Executive Director of the Amherst Business Improvement District, BID, and President of the Amherst Centre Cultural District. Sarah is a landscape designer and planner with over 25 years of experience in landscape architecture, regional and urban planning, and historic preservation. She's been the Executive Director of the Amherst BID since 2013. Sarah previously worked as the Director of Conservation and Planning at WD Coles, Inc. Land Company, and was partner at Conservation Works, LLC. Prior to joining Coles in 2008, Sarah worked for seven years as Senior Project Manager at Dodson Associates, Landscape Architecture and Planning. Sarah's work has ranged from scenic resource analysis and historic mill village and master plans to large-scale conservation restrictions and urban design projects across New England and New York State. From 2008 to 14, she also served as adjunct faculty in the UMass Department of Landscape Architecture and Regional Planning, LARP, teaching graduate courses in watershed planning and green infrastructure. She is a full member of the American Society of Landscape Architects. In, additional, in addition to her professional work, Sarah has served on the board of directors of several nonprofit organizations, including the Saratoga Springs Preservation Foundation, the STAR program at the Hood Center for Children at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center, Chesterwood Museum, and the Hitchcock Center for the Environment. Sarah currently serves on the board of directors for Common Capital and the Rotary Club of Amherst. Also, in 2016, she was appointed by then Senate President Stan Rosenberg to the Massachusetts Commission on the Status of Women. She currently serves as treasurer for the commission. Sarah received her Master's of Landscape Architecture from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst in 1990 and is a 1985 graduate of Mount Holyoke College. She has lived in Amherst, Mass. since 1997 with her husband and two children. Anne Burke is the Vice President of Economic Development Council of Western Massachusetts. She holds a BA from Miami University, Oxford, Ohio, and a Master's of Urban and Regional Planning from the George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Anne has over 30 years of professional experience with downtown specializing in downtown revitalization and strategic planning, management district, organizational development and operations, economic development, community engagement, and project management. She co-authored Enabling Legislation to Create Business Improvement Districts in Massachusetts, authored a guidebook for forming business improvement districts in Massachusetts, led the successful planning and development of bids, and advised numerous and other communities considering downtown management district organizational structures. John Del Conte, Professor of Creative Economy at UMass Extension Service, is a doctoral student in regional planning here at UMass Amherst. His main topic of study relates to creative placemaking, measuring its effects and testing its relationship to other outcomes, such as revitalization. John's experience in arts administration includes chairing of the Hillsborough Arts Council of North Carolina for 10 years while having a simultaneous career in health sciences as a medical writer. He's taught courses on community planning, world cities and creative economy and placemaking at Westfield State University, the University of Albany, the University of Massachusetts and New Hampshire Institute of Art. He received an MS in Sustainable Tourism from East Carolina University and an MS in Psychology from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and a BS in Biology from Union College. Ilan Tierney is the owner and principal of Kuhn Riddle Architects. Intrigued with how architecture permeates every aspect of our lives, from our homes to school and work environments, Ilan, a lead AP, strives to create unique and beautiful spaces for her clients while integrating the latest sustainable design elements. She became president of Kuhn Riddle in Kuhn Riddle Architects in 2018, and the firm is now certified as a women business enterprise, a WBE. She's worked in the professional design field since, two, since 1992. In addition to being the managing partner of the firm, she's principal in charge and project architect on a wide variety of educational, commercial, and residential projects. Her greatest strength and satisfaction comes from her artful ability to coordinate the collaboration between the client, 
design professionals and builders to realise a client's vision. Ilan has a Bachelor of Architecture with a minor in Architecture History from Carnegie Mellon University and began her career as a Community Development Peace Corps volunteer in Guinea, West Africa. She's Chair of the Central Business Architecture Committee of Northampton, Co-Chair of the WMAIA Committee on the Environment and also a Board Member of the Massachusetts Board of Registration of Architects. So please join me in giving them all a hearty round of applause. And so, are you ready for questions? Yeah, ready for questions. So let me start with this one. Question one. What are the Amherst area's unique assets that differentiate it as a place where people want to live, to work, and to learn? How can we harness those assets to promote further economic development in our community? And by unique assets, I mean natural resources, the beauty of the natural environment, education, historic downtown, and arts and, art and culture. And if you want to refer to other unique assets, please do. So over to you. You decide who goes first. In some college towns, there's the, the opportunity to have a love-hate relationship instead of really thinking about the fact that uh, communities that don't have colleges and universities there want colleges and universities there. The seniors want to live in college towns because, to take advantage of the educational and cultural opportunities, and they like to live in places that are not all seniors, so that they like the students being there and they like them and, and, and the interaction that that creates. So, I think one of the most amazing things is the fact that you have one of the best liberal arts colleges in the, in the world uh, here and then other uh, wonderful uh, liberal arts colleges in the region, but also a, the, a wonderful and incredible land use uh, in, uh, land anchor institution for, uh, at University of Amherst. And I, I say that because it's not only, and it's almost like love, Love your college. Love your love the fact that you're a college town and celebrate it and figure out ways to really take advantage of that opportunity. Related to that, if you look at the amazing resources that the university has to offer with, and I was just here with, on an innovation tour bringing companies to come to see the IELTS Center, and if you have not had a chance to look at the 30 core functions that the Institute of Applied Life Sciences Center brings to the region and to the world in terms of uh, people who want to, uh, companies that are in paper who use a roll-to-roll -roll technology and trying out and experiencing uh, the capabilities that can be uh, located at the Isle Center and the three major, the 30 different core functions that they have there is is really remarkable. And I have to, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the creative economy in this region and what it, it's rich with um, um, the the creative sector. And I was noticing the the difference in income of the creative economy in folks working in the arts, and that's one of the things that you know we we feel strongly about creating wealth for this part of what makes this region truly unique and and, and wonderful is the richness of the creative economy here. So those are just three things that I see as a, from a regional perspective and my experience in other cities and towns across the state and elsewhere and about how, to, how I think Amherst can capture and celebrate that uniqueness of being a college town. So, sorry. So we'll get this done. Uh, I'll maybe just, do I need that? Okay. So one of the things um, to sort of follow up with that is because it's sort of the land grant university concept, but what I like to call sort of rural in town, one of the really unique things about Amherst is the fact that we are surrounded by scenic beauty and critical natural resources, and yet we are an extremely vibrant, viable, thriving commercial core and cultural activities, the kinds of things people travel to New York or Boston um, we, you know, we get them here on the campuses, and yet you can walk any given way a mile and you're in the countryside, or you're um, accessing our history, our agrarian economy, which is why the land grant college ended up here in sort of boonie land back then. So when you look at the rich history and you look at 
both the natural resources that we have and, and the dichotomy of those with, you know, our downtown and our, you know, our, our new, our revitalized village centers, that's really pretty unique, I think. So talking about uh, North Amherst and the Mill District, and it has not only the historic aspect, and I mean, uh, the Jones family, 19th, ninth generation revitalization of um, North Amherst and the Mill District, and um, just like what Sarah was saying, what's around there, we have the Mill River and the Eastman Brook, and we have the Mill Valley Recreational Area, and we have um, just, it, the growth that is going to happen there for the community and um, I think is wonderful. And to, to reuse some of this history that was there, I mean, it used to be called the Dirty Hands District because that's where the laborers used to work and, um, and to show it as a, in a different light, I think is, is pretty exciting and having it be a different um, town center. Well, I'll jump in on the things that haven't been said already since you stole the best ones. <laughs> um, I, I think not only talking about Amherst, but talking about the region as a whole. I, I live in Northampton, but I work here in Amherst, and I feel like I have the best of both worlds. And I think that is something that's unique um, to this area, is we have Amherst, Northampton, and all of these towns um, that make it a rich place to live and offer opportunities. Um, and I think that's why people like to come here. When we first talked about these questions, uh, one of the, the questions following this was, well, why, why are you here? Why did you come here? Um, I was actually born while my parents were students at UMass, but I went away, um, lived in Boston and Worcester and Pittsburgh and Guinea, West Africa. But I came back because um, this is a great place to raise kids, and I think one of the things that's important about our economy is bringing families back. Um, and so we have really good public schools, and we need to keep our public schools great. Um, one of the things that was talked about a little bit was the agricultural surrounding. We have great food here. Whenever I travel to other parts of uh, the country, I think, wow, we have such great restaurants in this area, we're so spoiled, and all of these um, great farms around us is, is a huge asset. And then uh, just going out another ring in terms of uh, what's near us, we have easy access to New York City, I'd say less easy access to Boston, um, but you can get to Vermont, New Hampshire, the mountains, and, and to the ocean in a few hours, so that just makes us a very attractive place to live. We have a great place here and we can get to other great places really easily. I'd like to just throw one other piece in there. I think one of the um, truly unique things around about Amherst and really this region is sort of the growing economic, uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem that we see happening. And, and it has happened over the past 10 years to some extent, but it's really, really taking shape and beginning to, to uh, become much more robust. A few years ago, two years ago, I was working with Valley Venture Mentors in Springfield, and we start, we, we, people kept saying, Western Massachusetts is a great place to be a woman entrepreneur. And we were like, is that really true? You know, are we just saying that because, you know, we can, and we, we thought we'd start to talk about Western Massachusetts being a really good place to be a woman entrepreneur and to pursue uh, your entrepreneurial dreams in Western Massachusetts. And then we started to look at some of the data. And some of the data uh, the, of people coming out of Spark and Holyoke and, and at, at the Draper, uh, in, uh, Draper competition at Smith College and some of the things happening at the university and, and, uh, and elsewhere and VVM, we found that there were a disproportionate number of women and, uh, on, their, on teams and also in um, and, and women leads on, on, in entrepreneurial uh, ventures coming out of these organizations and the fact that we had these three women's colleges in the region and the fact that we had uh, a lot of renewed activity coming out of UMass in particular with 
with um, the Eisenberg School and the Bethune um, Center happening to support entrepreneurship. And if you look around and, and you look around just in your close-in neighborhood, close-in communities around Amherst, you'll see a lot of co-work spaces, maker spaces, uh, new funds that are beginning to try to develop uh, to support entrepreneurship. And I think that's really, uh, you see a lot of people coming out of these educational settings and beginning to see uh, entrepreneurship as a way to, um, to, to grow and to get their start here in Western Massachusetts. So I think that's, that's something that is a trend we've seen in the last few years in particular and something that I, I think is a real asset for our region. It's not Boston, but it certainly is a heck of a lot better than it was 10 years ago in here in Western Mass. Um, I think Sarah was looking at my notes because she stole what I was going to say. <laughs> um, in my research, um, doing focus groups about how places are vibrant, um, the residents that I spoke to in Amherst, I think their strongest point was that, com just to reiterate what Sarah was saying, that combination of having these pockets of cultural activity combined with the natural beauty. Um, so in, in, in essence, you have the, the kind of uh, big, well, the, the multiculturalism of the big cities, but set in the rural settings, and all the things that come with that multiculturalism, you have um, openness to diversity, you know, you have your, you know, your political leanings, et cetera. And so I think that would be uh, something to consider in terms of marketing the place, have that combination. If you throw in the cultural aspect, um, to get a little academic, and I'm not, I'm, sorry, I'm stuck in academics now, um, but uh, without getting, um, making too many lists, uh, you might just go down a checklist of what kind of assets we have in terms of, and we've met, already mentioned natural capital, we've mentioned um, cultural capital, one other one, I won't go through the whole list now, but one that we haven't mentioned is social capital right now. And so that's the building of those bonds amongst people. And, and what you want to do is strengthen that and have to, to have a vibrant community. And one of the um, one of the characteristics of arts and culture is that it can really bring people together and have that sharing. And that the, the good news is that that translates into other assets as well, including financial, economic, et cetera. So when we get the chance, maybe we could talk more about I'd like to talk more about how uh, we could strengthen that arts and cultural sector in order to build those bonds in, in the community, which I think relates heavily. If you listen to John's uh, listing of the mission for Amherst, um, he talked about the, the vibrancy of the economy, but also the vitality of um, you know, the open space and the, you know, the recreational activities, et cetera. So it all works together into a fabric. Jeff, did you want to? Yeah, very briefly. Um, I wanted to jump on one of Anne's original points, which is a college town, and add that I think that our intellectual capital and, and educated workforce, I know that in looking at economic development research, they, when they, whenever they ask businesses, what are what is troubling for you? What are you worried about? It's finding a quality workforce, and we have that in abundance here. So I think it's important, and just to give examples, 95% of Amherst residents have at least a high school diploma. 73% have at least a college degree, and nearly half, 43%, have a graduate degree or a professional degree. So very well educated in Amherst. And the other thing that I want to mention, so. I'll go to your second question, which is how do you harness that? And I think that is, that's how do you stop the brain drain in this instance? Um, and this was a question that was posed to me two weeks ago at the um, Secretary Keneally's forum in Western Mass. And I said, you have to have more, you have to build a stronger connection with students before they leave. You have to give them internships so that they have a boss or a mentor to talk to about where do I go for a job? How do I get there? Because looking back at my experience, which granted is, I graduated in 02, so several decades ago, everybody left after you graduate. You go back home. And there's no reason, if you don't have a reason, to come back or to, to keep a, a touch 
on what's happening in Amherst or in the region. And so the more reasons you give them to think about having employment or staying in the area, the better that is. And then the other thing that I think is a unique asset is uh, the almost universal um, desire to make positive change. And we may not all agree on what that positive change is or what it looks like, but I, I think almost universally uh, people in Amherst feel like they can make a positive change for themselves and other residents in the community at large. And I think that uh, I don't know how to harness that. Um, but but I think it is a, it is an asset, and you know, having lived in other communities where people are more apathetic about how things happen, I would much rather live in a community where people care about it and want to make positive change. And so I consider it an asset. And on that point, before moving on to the next question, which is about challenges, if any of you would like to talk a little more about something that John mentioned and Anne strengthening cultural vitality and maintaining that. Um, entrepreneurial ecosystem, and as Jeff mentioned, harnessing the assets we have in order to do that. Any ideas? So one of the things that that is a that that holds us back a little bit in, but around in the in the entrepreneurial ecosystem is we lose um, startups, we lose uh, innovation from this region because of lack of resources. So we're trying to always think about, and there have been new funds that have de been developed and new opportunities for people to invest in uh, startups and invest in companies to take that uh, work that's coming out of the university and make it and commercialize it and find the right um, uh, um, management uh, opportunities for people to team up with some of our some of the some of the talent that's coming out of the university to really make that happen i think that's how you harness it and help grow we know that in this region businesses grow up from 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 the ground most many of our companies in the region over 70 percent are under 20 employees so we know that 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 internal growth is a way to i think harness what's happening out here, and I do believe that we've seen some some real changes around um, in entrepreneurship, in particular. The, the Grinspoon Foundation has, um, in, in 14 colleges and universities in our region, they have a, a really robust entrepreneurship program to develop student entrepreneurs to, to to have them take their ideas and grow them. Now, not all these ideas are going to grow and flourish, but some of them are. And there's a lot of talent coming out of the university in terms of in commercialization of, of the work that's happening with the faculty at the university. So I think the ways that we can harness that and grow that is, is a real opportunity for us here in the region. And I think that's beginning to happen. You see a few new funds that are beginning to start up, but there needs to be more. That's one of the reasons that we lose people to Boston and we lose companies to California because that's where the investment is coming from. Yeah, Jennifer. Um, I want to, well, thank Jeff Kravitz for actually making Amherst, North Amherst in particular, an opportunity zone. So I've been talking to quite a few people, entrepreneurs that want to do startups and use um, the opportunity zone money in order to um, make programs um, come to North Amherst. And this may not have been an option for somebody without utilizing those opportunity zone funds. So I've been talking to uh, brewmasters and people who want art venues and music venues and um, trying to see how we can tap into that so that we can bring these people and these ideas you know, to Amherst and create jobs and create a vibrant um, community. So thank you. Sarah. So one of the things um, that uh, the bid and several of our partners, particularly the town, um, in 2016, we were designated a, uh, the Amherst Center Cultural District by the state. And um, there are more and more of these around the state, but we're one of only a few in this region. And it's important in understanding, we, we already had these assets. We had, as I think many of us talked about, the cultural assets, but they were operating in silos. And there wasn't um, an overall combined vision for what we could leverage together. And so, um, and by the way, I was the president until last week. Now Jeff is the president of the Amherst Center Cultural District. Yay, Jeff, thank you. Um, <laughs> so it'll be his baby. But um, that's been a really great relationship going forward because of our partners, Amherst College, UMass, and all the cultural organizations in downtown Amherst. 
because now we're leveraging funds from the Massachusetts Cultural Council, who um, got a significant increase again in funds this year, and they are giving those in grants to us each year. So, you know, these are opportunities that these things were already happening, but we just sort of got everybody on the same page and at the same table, and working together, we've been able to put some great things together and leverage some funds, um, and then boost, you know, all that data that's helping us understand who's coming to Amherst and the area and why. Uh, the visitor center, again, has been really critical. We keep track of everybody coming in, um, where they're from, the countries, it's been amazing, the states, um, and, then, and then why they've come, whether it's for the colleges and university, um, or uh, many are looking to retire, which has been fascinating to me, uh, and many more are now just coming because they saw it somewhere, it popped up, or it came, you know, they said, oh, you know, that Amherst looks like a really cool place to go. Um, but these are things that were already happening, and I think particularly in terms of the cultural organizations, it's just a matter of getting everybody talking together and being one, um, you know, one movement forward. Let me read the next two questions, and you can continue answering question one and questions two and three <laughs> together, because I think they, they're all sort of connected and I don't want to interrupt the flow of your, your conversation more. So let me just read questions two and three. Question two is, what barriers or challenges has your organization faced, or have your clients faced, and what is something tangible that municipal government, the chamber, or other organizations could do to address that, that challenge or barrier? And the third question, what do you envision for the future of economic development in the Amherst area over the next three to five years and the next 10 years? So, whichever of those you'd like to address next, in whichever order, I see Jeff, Jeff has got his, his hand there, so you take first. Yeah, I, wa I wanted to take you up on the offer to continue number one. Um, <laughs> and, but but uh, building off of Sarah's point, and I actually wanted to ask John a question, which is I, I think one of the things that we don't uh, do a great job of is telling the story. Sarah said we have these cultural institutions, we have this, this rich history in Amherst, um, we have visitorship, but we don't really know how many people, maybe individually, but cumulatively, we don't know. And so uh, my gut tells me that we should collect that data. And when we collect it and, and look at it together, we're going to say, somebody told me that we have four times as many um, creatives and artistic people in Amherst than in East Hampton, which I think for would, would, was surprising to me because of East Hampton's reputation as an artistic community. Um, so I, 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 gathering that type of information and saying, yes, we, we are this, and so I was gonna ask John, it, am, I, am I right? Or am I, is, is, how important is that, is telling your story um, a, as part of it? Um, well, I, you know, I'm using your data, the number of, uh, <laughs> number of artists that are here. Um, I think you're right, and one way to capture well, a couple ways to capture that might be uh, to look toward um, getting representation, like on, on say a panel like this. Um, I don't know how many of us are pure artists, et cetera. But one of the things I've learned in, in you know, teaching the course, et cetera, is uh, those communities that have more arts-led leadership uh, not only inject that culture, into the community, but you know they have artists have a, a different lateral way of thinking, and so they have, you know, just like that old Apple commercial, think differently, you know, and so I think you you, you solve problems in a novel way. Um, so I, I think you look for opportunities to bring artists into the fold. One way to do that, one of my solutions, um, or one possibility, a menu of, of possibilities, is to possibly have an art summit where you can bring them all together just to have a, a, a three-day charrette of, of open conversation. You know, what is your vision as an artist for the community? How could you envision better ways to work together? I know this is already being done in different contexts with the cultural economy or the creative economy, but uh, I just want to, uh, you know, just make sure that the artists are brought to the table in the conversation. That's a central tenet to creative placement. So I'm going to just kind of piggyback on your question. Uh, one of the things that I know when you had this established before and there was a conversation with Rick Sullivan, who's our CEO, talked about um, 
the things that are barriers. And one of the things that, that I saw in his notes, I went, oh, okay, was um, that it, it, there, there sometimes is an adversarial relationship between communities. And, um, and, and in telling the story about this region, it's, it's not, an easy, it's not a, an easy one to tell because if you go you know, from Franklin to Hampshire to Hamden County, you have several different stories to tell. And I think the time, it's, it's, it's now enough time has passed that you know, we did take a crack at this and, uh, and, and got um, a lot of robust feedback on trying to, to, to brand or create a brand for Western Massachusetts. Because we know when we look outside of the area and you call it, call it Asparagus Valley or Happy Valley, people really don't know what that is. And so trying to figure out you know, how, to, how to talk to an external market about Western Massachusetts and, and trying to describe and tell the story of who we are because Franklin County is very different than Hampshire County and Hampshire County is very different than Hamden County. But collectively, we have more power if we're, we're not that big of a region and we need to be talking about our region and selling all of these various a aspects of, of who we are and, and, and what makes us unique but also what makes us tie together as a region and what makes our, our regional economy tie together as a region. So I'll give you a couple of examples of how we've successfully done that and I think we can apply that to other ways. Um, Jeff is involved with us and, and, and the EDC convenes a group called the Economic Development Partners and it's really all of the economic development planning people for many of the cities and towns up and down the region and we do a, by, uh, every other year we do a developers conference and we work together to try to highlight the priority projects within our region for developers and investors who want to look, and businesses who want to look at locating their businesses in, in the region. And the idea here is that, sure, every community is going to fight like hell to try to, to try to keep a business if they, if they come to them first and to try to locate them in their community. But we're asking people, to, to those communities, to say, if we can't find a great spot in Amherst, then don't kick, don't let them drift into the woodwork, but to kick it back to the larger group to say, where can we keep this, this company to, who wants to locate in Western Mass because our workforce travels up and down the region. And this, adding, adding those companies within the region is, is, is a really important one. The other, uh, another example of this is recently we did with the Economic Development Partners in the EDC, we hosted an Opportunity Zone workshop. And what, we, what we're trying to do is to create this clearinghouse where we have the people who have d uh, the income who want to find places to invest in Opportunity Zones and take advantage of this uh, uh, national program. And and having those uh, those those invest in, in, um, investors looking at places like Am uh, North Amherst and, and and other opportunity zones up and down the region, uh, uh, finding the right and then finding uh, um, ready projects to have the, to and try to make those matches happen. And we've already seen investors from. Boston and from and from New York and from other areas and from the region, frankly, who have who have capital that they want to they want to plant somewhere and the opportunity zone projects become a piece of that. So trying to bring those opportunities all together and sell ourselves and tell our story as a region that there, yes, there are opportunities for that investment to happen. That's going to be the, the sum is greater than the smaller pieces, and we and we have to tell our story in that way. So. Who'd like to go next? And when you talk about um, barriers and challenges, feel free to mention natural gas, for example. Before the panel kicked off, we were discussing natural gas. Jeff has a great joke about natural gas, by the way, just so you know. Um, you don't have to tell it, but maybe you should know. So I, did, it's, I, I won't tell the joke, but I did hear that um, the federal government is now referring to it as freedom gas. So that, that's, uh, I, I think that was first announced yesterday. Um, so, you know, I, I guess I'll, did you want to talk about Barry? I, I, no, oh, any? Uh, all right, I'll, I'll jump Perfect. in, uh, unless he has more jokes. Um, the, the gas moratorium, um, for any of you aren't from, familiar with it, uh, they're, well, Long story short, there's several lines of natural gas that come to our region. There's two main companies, Columbia Gas and Berkshire Gas. Berkshire Gas feeds Amherst, Hadley, and Sunderland. So it's a line that comes across under the river in a different location than Columbia, feeding some of the areas south. Berkshire Gas issued a moratorium on gas service to Amherst and Hadley and Sunderland 
about two or three years ago now, and it was relatively precipitous. They had sort of alluded to the fact that they might do this, but um, it happened fast and it caught um, quite a few projects in downtown and in Amherst uh, off guard and literally they said, no, you will not get any more gas. So folks that had perhaps turned their gas off to renovate were not allowed to turn it back on. Um, and anybody literally changing out a stove just for a new stove that maybe had slightly more BTUs, no increase in BTUs. Um, and that's now indefinite. And so that changes the scope of growth and development in this area, uh, particularly for downtown propane. One business try did do it, but then went out of business. Um, so we don't have viable options on that yet. It's not something the municipalities can fix themselves. It, it's a broader uh, mission. But I think, again, as a, as a team working together and, and working with the gas companies, um, it, you know, I, I don't have an answer for it. But it's a huge challenge that's not going away anytime soon. And uh, I think it's critical to make sure it's out there, um, that everybody keeps you know, pushing Berkshire Gas or, or what, whatever we can to see it. somewhere along the way there's going to be an answer to that. Um, and I'm going to, I have one more thing I just wanted to bring up. Challenges, uh, at least for Amherst, somewhat Hadley, but only along their main drag, uh, aging infrastructure. So, um, you know, there are finite funds, as, as Paul or any of the town council will tell you, um, and improving things like sidewalks and filling potholes, those are the important things in people's minds because one, they're visible, one, they damage vehicles, um, and they are problematic. We have an extremely aged underground infrastructure, our gray infrastructure, if you will, and the future, I guess to the last question, the visioning, um, we need to, it's not gonna be a matter anymore for DPW to have to say, well, okay, we're gonna put money into roads and sidewalks. Well, that means it can't go into um, the underground non-sexy projects. So, you know, thinking forward about funds for infrastructure, I know the town, at least town of Amherst, is facing critical capital needs in building after building after building. But I think in order to plan for those buildings, you have to understand your infrastructure and the age of the things that are underground that might not be able to handle everything else you want to do. Thank you, Sarah. Good quick question for my timekeepers. Uh, John, Tony, can we go another 10 minutes till 5.20? Yes, great, thank you. Then uh, other panelists, how would you like to address the, the challenges barriers question or the, uh, the futuring question? John or Ella? Uh, I was just gonna say one of the um, sort of going back to how do we keep uh, young graduates here, um, I think that that is a challenge. We, our company has been very fortunate to have many UMass graduates come from the architecture department here at UMass, and it's been fantastic. We feel lucky to have that resource here. But I also know that there aren't enough jobs necessarily, um, or professional jobs like that. It's also very expensive to live here, and it's hard for a graduate coming out with a, a lot of debt to find an affordable place to live. Um, and I think that's a challenge. We're, we have a lot of young people here because of the colleges, and we have a lot of people who are retired or interested um, people coming here to retire, which is great, but I worry about the middle. What happens to the middle? We need the middle, the movers and shakers who are generating um, the income. Uh, and so that's a challenge, and I don't have an answer for that. Um, other than being creative and investing in ways of uh, providing affordable housing, not necessarily Section 8 housing, but affordable market rate housing um, so that we can keep those young people here and, and they become the heart of our communities. Um, I think a couple of things that uh, I just wanted to touch base really quickly on, on the gas moratorium, and I know um, this isn't necessarily a, a popular position, but uh, in some ways, the gas moratorium has forced us to think about how to build buildings more efficiently. And um, I think that that's something as a local community and a state community and a country and the world need to think about. Um, 
And so, yes, it's been very difficult. And we've had clients who have, have suffered because of um, that gas moratorium, but it has forced our company to think about how do we make our buildings more energy efficient, uh, invest more in the, in the envelope of the building. Yes, you have to pay more for uh, higher efficiency HVAC systems, but um, it's, it's cost now versus cost later. So I think that that's something that Amherst is invested in. We, you know, the whole net zero um, policy for public buildings is kind of amazing. I'm not sure how we're going to do it, but it's, it's, a, it's a great goal to have. And I, I think, um, like we were talking about earlier, there's a desire here to make positive change locally and, um, and regionally. And that's a good thing. John. Oh, Jennifer, then John, then oh, Jennifer. Okay. Um, yeah, was, did you have something to say about gas first? Me? Yeah, or, well, I was oh, I, uh, go ahead. you do? You well, I was might gonna, just stick with the same topic. Yeah, I was just going to, you know, go on what yeah. Alon said. I agree with you with that, but I also saw with my former position how difficult it was for businesses to go into existing businesses and then not be able to make the changes necessary in order for them to be viable and how hard that is. And I do think that you have to think into the future about what we can do and what can we put in place to, to help businesses like that, you know, if there was something that they could do. Um, I also think that going on what you were saying about um, affordable housing as doing workforce housing and trying to maybe adjust or change some of our zoning in order to make that easier for people so that the density can be different, the size of the homes could be different, the affordability would be different. How can we make um, that middle income people stay here and raise their children here and, you know, and age in place here? Um, I think that that's something that I see very much that people are not wanting um, to move to Florida. They want to stay here and have all the amenities that Amherst has um, within the community. And how can we do that? Can we do overlay districts? How can we change our zoning, you know, to make that happen? Um, on the idea of, of, or on the topic of what we can do to harness our number one asset, which is, you know, the five colleges, the human capital that we have here, and linking that to the, um, let's say, entrepreneurial spirit, uh, I, one of the things I was talking with Tony about before we um, started today is, you know, we have service learning uh, with all five colleges, and their mission is uh, primarily to, to kind of help uh, social, social um, issues and problems in the community. So I, I wondered if that model can somehow be widened. Uh, I know if you had a, a, some, some kind of social entrepreneurship, it would definitely fall under the venue of, 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 um, of the, the community-based learning model where you could design a curriculum to solve a particular problem. So if you wanted to build uh, some type of renewable energy type of business, it would be easy to plug into and use those resources, get a professor linked up to the project with his class and, and work on it. But there, there are barriers to that. As Tony mentioned, you know, what happens if the project extends beyond a single year after that class turns over, et cetera. So I, I just throw that out there as a possibility of, of opening up that model to, say, for-profit uh, ventures that might not necessarily have a, a social um, mission attached. I think uh, just to flip to a little slightly different topic is, it, is the topic of, of transportation. I'm sorry. I, I think just to, to touch on one, the east-west rail co connection and the north-south rail connection is, is an important one and one that, you know, that we've looked at thinking about the transportation system you know, holistically and sort of reinforcing the, the rail connections, the, the bike paths and the lip in this, in the, the um, uh, complete streets sort of ideas and it to reinforce all of the the various opportunities from vans to ubers to buses to to the east west rail connections are important because one of the things that we have observed and we hear from our companies all the time is that getting workforce to the places to, where they need to be to to work 
is, is a challenge. You know, the public transportation system doesn't really work really well in our region. Um, it's a hub and spoke system. It doesn't really necessarily function well. So trying to really think about how do you change that? How do you align the, uh, the um, resources that are out there um, and, and the new resources that could be developed to, to, to think about our transportation system more holistically? And then finally, I, I think that the notion that I, I know that, and I think uh, there, I know that the, it's always not a, complete in agreement topic around housing in your downtown, downtown in Amherst and, and other communities. But I think that it, we need to think about how do we create residential opportunities in, uh, in and close to where people work and, and, and in downtowns because people want to work or to walk to work and, they, and, and, and all change is not bad. So sometimes looking at adding new residential opportunities in communities it's scary sometimes because you're changing the way the communities have traditionally thought about housing. But th building off of the, qu the comment about you know zoning and thinking about how do you take how do you put in place the mechanisms that need to be put in place to support a variety of types of housing un housing development so that you can you can keep young people here. Seniors can age in place and move to different kinds of, of, um, of uh, residential opportunities. How do people uh, stay here and be here and, and look at and have a variety of choices that they can, they can choose from and be in your community and grow in your, and age in your community and attract new people. So I think that that requires um, sometimes more of a compromise in, in, in in communities that have very strong opinions on one way, one side or the other about adding residential opportunities or changing residential opportunities and how that might happen. And I think that mm -hmm. that's a challenge for Amherst, but I think it's an opportunity for Amherst too. Thank you. In, in, thank you, Anne. In five minutes, we take the conversation downstairs, so please don't go anywhere. But in the remaining five minutes, uh, zoning, energy, housing, you've got five minutes to fix it. Go. <laughs> Um, well, I, I guess I wanted to, I, I will touch on that. Um, I, I, Jen had mentioned uh, about business assistance and um, somebody in the audience, give me the, if I can't say this, but um, there was a proposal for, to, to do that, to give businesses um, some assistance because of the moratorium and, and the state government didn't allow that to move forward. So there, were, there was attempts to do that. Um, by Berkshire Gas, so I, d I did want to say that. Um, on, on the energy issue, you know, another interesting thing there, especially in light of steel tariffs and trade wars and whatnot, you know, there's the ability to construct buildings out of cross-laminated timber. And a perfect example of that is the design building here at UMass. And I don't know this for sure, but I think the cro closest cross-laminated timber mill in the United States is in the Pacific Northwest. We have um, two rather large lumber companies in the region. Um, and so if we had cross-laminated timber, maybe that's another uh, more sustainable, at Look, you're talking about building materials. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong, but maybe a more sustainable um, and uh, environmentally friendly way of building um, that, that goes to energy as well. And you don't have to ship it all the way across the country in order to use it. We have the raw materials and the ability, well, not yet the ability to, to create it here, but potentially. Um, and it could be a, a hub for this type of construction throughout the, uh, at least the Northeast, if not the entire East Coast. So, um, and yeah, so I don't want to steal <laughs> any, anybody's thunder on that, but I thought that was an energy related point that I wanted as a potential solution. Thank you, Jeff. And who um, would like the, uh, the penultimate word before we move the conversation downstairs? Oh. I, don't want, I don't need to be penultimate. Well, <laughs> I, I, I wanted to mention zoning. <laughs> um, Sarah, I know. I, I, I really get interested in these topics. Um, the town, I'm excited because the town is, many of you know, um, looking at 40R. And there's another forum coming up here somewhere along the way. Um, so I think that's really awesome that the town, at least the town of Amherst, is being proactive and 
understanding what 40R is and how it can help a community. Um, so I think that's, you know, the zoning, Amherst zoning, many of you probably heard me, you, I personally think you just toss it all out and start over because it's a mess. But um, addressing things like 40R, um, I think is, you know, really, it's, it's a great, great start for getting us at least somewhere into the 21st century on our zoning. So yep. I, I just want to say, um, maybe in closing, <laughs> um, some things that I think that we can do and, and that this community is already interested in is investing in our public schools, investing in affordable market rate housing. All those um, examples that went up were great. There's more housing um, coming online. Building energy efficient net zero buildings to help combat climate change. Um, changing the zoning to create more dense downtowns or neighborhoods so that we can maintain our beautiful open spaces, creating multi-use buildings that incorporate housing and create pedestrian-friendly neighborhoods or downtowns, create performing art spaces, we talked about that a lot today, that draws people into town who will then visit our shops and restaurants, um, and let people park for free after 6 p.m. Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, on that, uh, or, or, or add a parking garage. Amherst needs a new parking garage. <laughs> and and add a parking garage. So with with that, uh, please, like I said, stick around. Let's move downstairs with his food. And before you do that, let's give the panelists a hearty round of applause. <laughs> thank you, and thank you, UMass Amherst. Photo marketing. Thank you. I just want to say a few words. I wasn't expected to speak. I wasn't feeling great. But I want to thank John Page for organizing this incredible event. For everyone who's showing up tonight, for our panelists who've been so patient. Um, there was a lot of rescheduling, so we're really happy that everyone was patient, and, uh, patient with us and this all worked out. And I really am taking to heart this conversation. I, you know, I thought this was all going to be about parking. <laughs> we're situated downtown, and that's what we hear a lot about. But today was such an eye-opener. Um, I feel like we heard a lot about human capital, intellectual, educational, creative, community. We have an amazing amount of capital to harness. And that's a really exciting place to be and a great position for our chamber to be in, to be an advocate on so many of these issues. And we've already begun to partner with folks like UMass Amherst right here. I see Emily in the audience um, and partnering with Greg Thomas on some of the issues that were mentioned tonight in really harnessing the youth uh, and really trying to keep them here. So stay tuned because we really do want to work together with you um, on some of the issues that you heard about tonight to really make, um, to bring that vibrancy forward and you know to really make other people to tell our story and why we all live and work here. So thank you for being here and I look forward to seeing you downstairs. And if I didn't see you and greet you, I'm sorry, come get your name tag from me downstairs. Thanks again.